unless we change unless we change our ways of producing food insects as a whole will go down the path of extinction in a few decades the repercussions this will have for the planet's ecosystems are catastrophic hello everyone thank you for joining us tonight my name is Randy. I'm with the events team here with the University Bookstore in Seattle. What I just read to you is a quote from Oliver, Oliver Millman's new book, The Insect Crisis. Oliver is a journalist and a correspondent with The Guardian. Also joining us tonight are panelists Barry Brosi, who is a biology professor and an expert on bees at the University of Washington and Dr. Gabriela Chabarier, who is the executive director of the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture. Thank you very much for being here. And just a reminder, links for the insect crisis and other books that we will talk about tonight will be listed in the chat. If you have any questions, please submit the questions to the question and answer link down below at the bottom of the screen there will be a question and answer session at the end of our discussion. And this show will be recorded for future viewings on our YouTube channel. And now I wanna read one more quick quote before I turn it over to Oliver. Without bugs, the world would return to the state of a billion years ago, composed primarily of bacteria, algae, and a few simple plants. Oliver Billman, thank you for joining us with your new book. Uh, it's a real delight to have you. Some of the things in the book are, quite frankly, rather terrifying. So please go ahead and, and tell us about it. Well, thanks very much. And I hope to not terrify you all now. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's, it's lovely to speak to, uh, speak to you all about this. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, so in terms of the book, I would say, you know, the most consequential important loss of biodiversity on this planet is perhaps the least known. I mean, we, while many of us are kind of rightly concerned about the demise of tigers and rhinos and polar bears, the significance of those losses pales into comparison to the silent catastrophe that's uh, currently unfolding in the insect world. And we may consider insects to be annoying or uh, irrelevant, but they actually underpin life as we know it on this planet, from the food we eat to the soils and plants we all depend upon to the feces and dead bodies that we are thankful don't litter our surroundings. Um, the biologist here, Wilson, who passed away this year, he said um, human would, humans would only last for a few months without insects. Um, we should be extremely grateful that they're around and yet we're subjecting them to the greatest challenge that they've ever faced in the, their 400 million years spent on earth by stripping away their habitats, uh, poisoning them and subjecting them to a radically changed climate. Um, we're losing insects at a frightening rate in many places around the world and something and that's something that scientists are only just becoming fully aware of. Um, my book, The Insect Crisis, The Fall of the Tiny Empires Around the World, uh, chronicles the uh, startling declines of insects around the world from the nature preserves of Germany to the rainforests of Puerto Rico, uh, to the mountains of central Mexico, uh, also learning along the way some interesting facts like uh, how bumblebees can play soccer and how a certain water beetle can escape being eaten by a frog by escaping out of his anus. So it's it's a, it's a hopefully an interesting read for people, but the, the, the book explores really how the insect crisis uh, at its heart is, is very much a crisis for us too. Uh, it threatens food insecurity and a quieter, more lifeless world. Um, it's it's important to save insects for their own sakes, but we need to save ourselves too. So um, that is how I'd sum up the book. Great, thank you, Oliver. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here with you, and to be here with Barry. Uh, we are both, you know, insect enthusiasts, bee lovers, and you know, before we launch into all sorts of insect questions. Uh, I think, you know, we wanted to start the conversation with you about hearing more about how this book came together. Clearly, the book has a lot of research. You talked to some incredible scientists. You brought, you know, this, the science that the, everybody's doing around the world 
into a book and in a book that anybody can read because it is a beautiful read. You're a fantastic writer. So we wanted to understand a little bit more about, you know, the process, how the book came together, how, you know, how long it took you uh, to write this book. And, and anyway, and just your time now, just share with us, you know, that process. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I've been an environmental writer for the last um, 10 years or so, uh, working for The Guardian here in the US and in Australia. Um, and I think like many people in my field, I've been drawn to the kind of uh, the, the kind of charismatic beasts of our world, the kind of most kind of striking things that we all kind of are drawn to when it comes to environmental topics. You know, I've been on the Great Barrier Reef diving, looking at coral loss. I've been in, you know, uh, the Amazon to look at the declines in um, biodiversity there. I've I've um, written about polar bears and uh, lions and rhinos and so on because those are the big kind of showy things that kind of um, grab our attention and we feel kind of closest to as, as people. But I think it was around kind of 2018, 2019, I kind of realised that there was this kind of background disaster happening with insects that scientists were only just kind of getting to grips with. There was a kind of uh, slew of studies that came out 2018, uh, sorry, 2017, 2018, uh, documenting these kind of quite startling declines, um, you know, huge declines, 75% down in nature preserves in Germany. Uh, this uh, study from Puerto Rico, 98% in the forest floor of the rainforest there, uh, down since the 1970s. Um, and another study in Denmark, 97% uh, decline in insects since the uh, since the 90s. There, I mean, those are quite amazing numbers. I mean, you don't really you don't really see those kind of declines in such a short period of time. And we may have lost kind of 95% of all the tigers in the world, but that's over a kind of 100 150 year period of time. It's not over a couple of decades. And I think it was kind of interesting to kind of look through all the research and, and, and kind of realize that although the picture is not complete, we do not know the rate of decline in every um, part of the world when it comes to insects. We, um, we, we do know that they are in big trouble in, in many parts of the world. And I kind of thought it was a good idea to start looking at that and explain that for people. Thank you for that. It's a, it's a great answer. And I think it really, um, is a nice segue to, to my first question. And that is um, really as a scientist, I, one of the things I think about a lot is um, putting together evidence, you know, scientific evidence for, um, for trends. And, you know, I've thought about a lot about plant pollinator interactions, for example, and pollinator declines, but showing, you know, actually presenting proof of, of these declines um, is, is really hard to do. Um, and in the book, um, and, and you just mentioned um, some of these lines of evidence that scientists have um, begun to use to put together, I think, a really compelling case for uh, global insect declines. But I'd love to hear um, a little bit more about one or two of these um, uh, studies that you um, incorporated in the book um, that really provide some, some compelling evidence for um, insect declines. So could you tell us about one or two of those studies? Yeah, sure. And, and and I guess you will know as much as anyone that it wasn't until fairly recently that scientists actually thought about the idea of counting bugs or, or, or assessing population trends because they always seem so numerous and it seemed kind of pointless to, to do so. But there were these kind of standout studies that, that occurred in 2017 was a, was a, a major one in Germany um, where these, uh, this entomological group had uh, been trapping insects uh, and um, they crunched the data um, since 1989 the average uh, uh, annual weight of flying insects caught in these traps across 63 protected um, nature reserves across Germany had fallen 76 percent um, and they they had some very rich data and it kind of showed this kind of sharp decline I think the summer time decline was even worse it was 82 82 percent um, and that really kind of kicked off this kind of media interest in insect declines. You started hearing about insectageddon and all these other kind of terms that we've now become um, aware of. Um, I think the other one was the Puerto Rico study that I mentioned before. Um, this um, entomologist, who uh, Brad Lister from upstate New York, he 
went there in the 1970s and put these plastic plates with sticky substances in the canopy and on the forest floor. And he said that, you know, when he came back to them, they were kind of matted black with insects in the 70s. But when he went back there a couple of years ago, just there was barely anything flying around. He found this kind of amazing 98% decline. Um, and then the other one was probably my favorite piece of research was that um, uh, research done in Denmark by the uh, scientist Anders, uh, Anders Papin Muller. And he, he realized there were fewer birds um, in the countryside he grew up in um, uh, that he could recall. And he wondered if it was down to a, a lack of insects. So he took part in this rather eccentric experiment of driving a beat up old Ford Anglia, 1960s Ford Anglia up and down the same stretch of road in Denmark. And he's been doing that every summer since 1997. And he found uh, and, and counting the bugs that hit the windshield. Um, and he uh, he found there's been a 97% decline there. Um, so, I mean, those are the three that really stack, stick out, but there have been lots of other kind of studies, um, you know, uh, yeah, butterfly numbers are down, but 80, 84% in the Netherlands since the late 19th century, British butterfly numbers are down by half in the last 50 years. I mean, the more you look, the more you find these kind of studies showing that um, there are some really steep declines going on. Thank you. That's um, yeah, it's a, some really uh, fascinating work that's going in. I think I think one of the things, um, the real take home messages from from that to me is the, the value of long term data and uh, really of scientists being able to gather those data consistently over over a long period of time and then they can use that um, temporal record to really draw these um, conclusions <clears throat> so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and ask another question and then then I'll kick it over uh, t uh, back to um, back to Gabby um, but one of the things that I think is um, really important that you cover in the book is the multiple important services that insects um, play in our world um, and, um, you know, as someone who works on plant pollinator interactions, I, I think a lot about um, pollination in particular. Um, but um, I'd, I'd love to hear what service you think is kind of most important um, that insects play that um, I guess it's both most important and that you're most uh, concerned about going forward. I mean, I think it is the food uh, production side of things that maybe is the most alarming. I mean, as you'll know that um, about a third of the world's food crops depend on animal pollinators. Um, you know, without without um, insects, we would have, you know, no apples, cranberries, melons, uh, almonds, broccoli. I mean, the list goes on and on, doesn't it? Um, and I think uh, the concerning thing is that there's been a uh, seemingly a decline in pollination services at the time when the demand for pollination is growing. I mean, obviously you've got a, a growing global population. Um, the United Nations has warned of this as being a kind of food security issue going forward. So I think that concerns me in terms of a potential crunch point where you think about, um, you know, malnutrition and certain in, certainly in poorer parts of the world, um, that's going to be a kind of unfolding uh, disaster for them if this problem is not arrested. And I think we're going to, hit a kind of horrible choice at some point where um, we can e either need to um, create more farmland to, to feed the world's population through cutting down rainforests, which would be you know, terrible for biodiversity or, or more intensively farm the land we do have with more chemicals and so on, which again is, is, is not ideal. So um, I think that's the, that's the biggest kind of worry when it comes to, to, to pollinator losses is you know, that food security issue. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna take this a little bit into a different direction, Oliver, so bear with me. Um, you know, I'm a scientist, but I'm also, you know, I now am the executive director of the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture. And museum historical, you know, they're, they're a library of, you know, of, of nature and cultural. So, but, you know, as I was reading your book, you know, several weeks ago, because I'm a big fan of The Guardian, so I had read that review and I read the book, uh, what was more interesting for me was how do we educate, you know, the public 
And I think, you know, and I want to hear your, your thoughts as you were reading, writing this book, if that was your intent, you know, to create awareness among the general public. Because, yes, you bring a lot of scientific information, but you're not, you know, writing it as a scientific paper. You're writing it for the general public. So what was your intent as you were, you know, uh, writing this? Yeah, I mean, I think the most interesting part for me, I think, is the cultural aspect about how we view insects and, and how there's a mismatch between how we culturally view them and, and their actual importance to us. And there is a huge mismatch. I mean, we we are kind of, you speak to entomologists who do outreach in schools and they kind of say that kids in kindergarten love insects. They find them fascinating and cool. They have amazing abilities. But then by the time they get to high school, um, um, the children hate them um, and think that they're, they're revolting and don't want anything to do with them. So obviously we're taught at some point in, in our lives to uh, be wary of them, treat them as pests or annoying or, or, or what have you. So I think that cultural element, I think, is what interests me. Um, uh, you know, how we, even how we talk about insects, we call them creepy crawlies, it's quite a rude thing to say. We say that people are bugging us if, we, uh, if we're annoyed by them. We, we just have this kind of distaste for them. And I think that um, that has led us to be ill prepared to how to deal with this crisis because we, we, we don't really appreciate what they do for us. Um, we've kind of taken, taken for granted all the kind of unheralded, uh, unglamorous work they do in breaking down uh, uh, waste, um, pollinating our food, doing all this kind of like background work to keep our, you know, forests and grasslands all vibrant and w working in kind of functioning order. And um, I think the interesting thing for me is like, I think a key question is how quickly we can kind of grasp that importance and 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 use it in a kind of galvanized way to to um, uh, do something to help insects because ultimately, like I say, for kind of selfish reasons, we, we should do that to help ourselves. As a follow up to that, uh, one of the things that you just say, you know, is, you know, children love insects. I was one of those. I'm sure Barry was one of those too. And I'm probably one of, one of the few, Barry and I are that, you know, we continue to love and have a passion for insects. What can we do, you know, to engage? Because, you know, your book, children are not gonna read this book, but do you think parents are going to translate to children? Uh, that uh, way, you know, that love that they have as little kids, you know, it continues as they grow. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I mean, I think that, you know, as you'll know, there's kind of what, maybe a million named species of insect. But what, what do we think of fondly amongst those? You know, maybe a maybe a bee or two. Usually a honeybee. People think of honeybees when you think of bees rather than other kinds of bees. We like butterflies because they're pretty and fireflies. And that's kind of it. Um, uh, so I think it's kind of ambitious to think that um, we're going to raise a generation of children loving every type of insect, every cockroach and every <laughs> mosquito out there. I mean, that's probably a little too much to ask for but I think we can we can maybe you know think about the ones that we do feel fondly about and have an understanding of uh, in terms of their importance and then uh, fully kind of grasp the meaning of what what they mean to our world I mean uh, you know not just honeybees but wild bees um, you know butterflies are great and it's fine that we just like them aesthetically rather than being you know ecologically crucial um, you know, we, we should appreciate beauty as well as function. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's, it's important to kind of not let kids kind of lose that kind of childlike wonder of, of insects um, uh, and not try and push them too far away, because I think that's kind of led to a lot of our problems. We've kind of sanitized our world in many respects, haven't we, of, of nature, really, but particularly insects um, and, you know, letting that a little back back in maybe in your backyard people can realize there's little to be afraid of and much to appreciate that's great i mean <clears throat> excuse me um i think it's this kind of topic of um what can we do to to make things better is a really key and important one um so i'd like for you oliver to imagine that you're given a sort of 
magic wand of, uh, of policy that would allow you to draft um, a piece of policy or legislation in the US that would then immediately be enacted um, with no debate or any of that. So if you wanted to use that um, uh, magic wand, uh, magic policy wand to help insects, what would you do? So what policy or legislation would you enact if you could just do one? One thing. Yeah. Ooh, well, that's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> you'd be tempted to kind of ban neonicotinoids like they have in the European Union. Um, you'd probably be even more tempted to kind of, um, you know, demand that uh, their wildlife corridors that go through all agricultural land um, so that the land isn't farmed right up to the border. Um, and you'd be tempted to, um, uh, impose a diktat that nobody could have a kind of manicured short grass lawn <laughs> because it's just unnecessary and uh, is boring and um, you know culturally being brought up that that's the American dream to have you know a two-car garage and live in the suburbs with a, a, a big boring lawn um, so I pick any one of those maybe the wildlife corridors because I think it's kind of as you'll know kind of if you give insects just a little space to breathe the breathing room um they, they can bounce back and so even if you have a kind of monocultural field of soy or corn um just those weeds are there at the what we call weeds again is a it's a sub subjective term isn't it it's a plant that we think is in the wrong place but a weed is is food and shelter for an insect if we just let you know some of those plants kind of grow at the edges and and made that mandatory and made that a network through the land i think that would do a great deal uh, and that's not even mentioning climate change, doing something about climate change. <laughs> there's, there's too many to think, isn't there? But maybe maybe that one. Yeah, there's there, there are a lot of things to, um, to, to address. So no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Very, you, I, was going you to invite, I was going to invite before you, uh, as I'm, I know you're going to pose the same question to Barry, and I want to yeah. ask that too. But before Barry answers, I want to invite, you know, the people that are participating. If you have any questions, please just type them in in the Q&A in the bottom of your screen. And, and then we can ask the questions to Oliver. Barry. Yeah, so so Oliver, you're, you're flipping the question back at me. Is that, did I yeah, interpret well, that right? I wonder, yeah. you, I wonder what you choose. Obviously you are the researcher in this area. So you probably have a more yeah, um, I think part of part of my reason for um, for asking the question is um, I served on this intergovernmental platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services uh, pollinator assessment. So this brought together scientists from many many countries around the world um, in a platform much like the um, the IPCC for climate change, but but instead kind of focused on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And the very first um, working group or, um, or assessment of that, uh, of that group um, was on pollinators and that's the one that I was part of. And, and specifically I did serve on the policy chapter of that um, assessment report. And um, so, so this is something that um, we are certainly all, um, all thinking about um, in terms of the, the co-authors on that chapter. I think from, from my perspective, um, I mean, I think the, the first two things that you mentioned in terms of um, uh, thinking about pesticide reform and, and also thinking about um, ways to um, make nature, um, integrate nature into um, agricultural landscapes, I think are really two of the most important things. I think my my instinct would be to um, think about pesticide reform maybe as a first step because it's something that is so um, concrete. Um, I think you, you particularly mentioned this class of uh, insecticides called neonicotinoids that are um, now the most commonly used class of insecticides on earth, but they were really only introduced in the 1990s. And that was around the time that we started to see some of the really most serious declines in a lot of um, these insect populations. And, and for um, bees, for example, we know that they are exquisitely sensitive to neonicotinoids and even doses that don't kill them outright 
um, can really change their behavior at, at, um, at doses that are measured in the parts per billion um, even. So I think um, all of those things to me um, point to something that you know we really should be looking at. And I think it's also something that um, is a, a relatively straightforward policy lever, right? If it's something, something that we can uh, regulate um, and whereas some of these things are, are much harder or to really affect change requires a lot of different kinds of, of moving parts. Um, so I, I do think um, the pesticide part would be part of, would be a big part of that equation to me. I think the way that the United States in particular regulates um, toxic chemicals is uh, challenging because it's basically, um, we, we presume them to be innocent. We presume them to be safe until they're, um, proven um, harmful. And I think if we turned that presumption of innocence around for, for chemicals, uh, I think that would make a, a big difference in terms of, um, uh, of insect health in the long run. Yeah. And you know, um, I, uh, Oliver, I used to work for the federal government, the Fish and Wildlife Service, was very, very involved with you know, pollinator protection, particularly. And, and sometimes, you know, now I think in retrospect, how frustrated it is sometimes, you know, in this country that, you know, what more evidence do we need to show, you know, and with nicotine-based uh, pesticides, we have decades of data. We already have seen the impacts. We've already seen regulations, you know, across the globe, Europe, Canada. And, you know, and I just, you probably guys saw the, the news this morning, you know, the EPA is still considering and is, they're not gonna make a decision until at the end of the year. So, so that, you know, how can we, you know, what, how can we become better lobbyists? <laughs> that, you know, that's what it comes down. How can we, became, we become better lobbyists? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, I think it goes to a kind of fundamental problem, of, like you say, how the precautionary principle isn't used when it comes to um, um, allowing new chemicals and drugs. I mean, it's not just uh, in pesticides, is it? In the US, it's, you know, cosmetics. It's kind of everything. Um, you know, the industry has the, has the kind of um, presumptive uh, uh, backing of, of, of government to, to do what it wants until we find out disastrous um, consequences from that. And even then it's hard to withdraw them. So yeah, I think that would be a really good step to turn that on its head like um, like this just then. Do you wanna read one of the public questions? Sure, so we, we got a, a question from uh, Ron who is asking, uh, regarding kids learning at some stage to dislike bugs, is this universal or are there countries slash cultures where it doesn't happen? Can we learn from such countries or cultures and do better in our own education? So I think this is a great, uh, great question. Um, and I actually don't know the answer. So Oliver, I don't know if you know or, or, um, or if Gabby, that's something that you can weigh in on. Yeah, I mean, that's... Um... That's a really interesting question. I think we do kind of look at it from a Western point of view, of course, um, and it may well be that the, the biggest declines are happening in the West because of our um, the urbanization, um, monocultural farming practices, pesticide use and so on is so heavy in Europe and North America. So um, our relationship with insects is probably, oh, I'm sure it's, it's much different from um, places in Asia and Africa and South America, where, where if you um, can recall, um, eating insects has become, uh, has been a, a thing for generations there. I mean, I think there's something like 2,000 species of insects that are regularly consumed by uh, cultures across, um, across those continents. Um, and so that kind of changes the whole dynamic of your relationship with insects because suddenly they're a valuable food source for yourself. Um, and uh, also if you're a small holder, small hold farmer, for example, you're eating the food that you're producing around you, you have more, you're invested far more in, in that and the care of the, that land than a you know, large agricultural corporation that you know, owns <laughs> however million acres of, of soy, for example. So I think the, I think the relationship is, is different there. Um, uh, and uh, we could probably take a page from the, the book of, um, 
many other cultures when it comes to to insects there so for sure yeah i love your answer and uh, you know i grew up in mexico so you know indigenous uh populations and not only in mexico but across the globe you know they have a better respect and understanding about insects and they have you know they've given us so much but sometimes you know we just go in different directions and you know there's this big movement you know the natives and you know protective you know the native pollinators and the native flowers and but you know still you know we have to fight you know the big industrial agriculture because you know we need to feed the world uh, but how can we do that in a more you know friendly sustainable way i think that's that's the key to the to the castle yes I mean, I, I mean, even just looking at lawns by themselves was kind of interesting for the for the book. I kind of learned that the largest irrigated crop in the in America is lawns. It's three times the size of all the corn that's planted in this country. I mean, it's enormous. And it's kind of a, this kind of desert, really, for insects. But that, that's very, very much a kind of American ideal. You go to China or India, there isn't this kind of fetish for lawns. It's um. It's a kind of very different relationship with with the environment and what's um, what's really valued. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of this comes down to culture. I mean, a lot of it comes down to cultural appreciation, the idea of subjugating nature and extracting as much as we can from it, uh, rather than you know living in harmony with it, uh, thinking holistically about the uh, the world, not you know fetishizing this idea of a kind of tidy ordered kind of um, place where everything is you know in its right place um because insects don't really like that world do they they like disorder they like chaos they like a jumble of plants and vegetation and you know untidiness that's why you see them by the side of highways and in derelict buildings and then you know they don't like the sanitized world that we we kind of um like so i think yeah culturally it's really important that we maybe think about amending our ways. Um, one of the, um, I mean, I think we've been talking some about, um, you know, these these remedies and um, potential, you know, paths to um, turning this problem around. But I, um, I'd love to hear, Oliver, what, what sources of hope that you see um, that are out there in terms of the potential for um, turning this around and, and um, maybe if you could share a success uh, story or two with us, that would, that would be great. So it's not all doom and gloom here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think certainly awareness is one that's changed. People are, I think in the last couple of years, getting to grips with the idea that there is a problem in the insect world it does affect us that we should do something about it obviously save the bees is the kind of rallying cry for a lot of people and it may just be centered around bees because we think mostly about bees but um you can see that spilling over into other areas people thinking about you know uh, urban um, wild gardens i saw one in new york city on the roof of a former oil factory in um in, uh, in brooklyn new york city incredible place with wildflowers and it was alive it was humming with life insect life um and you can see that people are kind of grasping that um idea and kind of running with it um you see kind of legislation as well um a lot of really good work being happening in europe to require farmers to have wildflower borders um, there's the ref big referendum they have in Bavaria and Germany where um, they decided 30% of um, farmland would become organic and insect friendly to kind of restore wetlands and hedgerows and uh, cut pesticide use, um, do something about light pollution. Uh, they banned gas powered leaf blowers in Germany to, because uh, of the um, destruction they do to obviously piles of leaves that insects like to, to crawl into. So um there is there is a lot happening and i think um i think a kind of encouraging thing is that it's not like we need to invent a new vaccine for this or win a space race or you know invent some new technology it's it's kind of letting go a bit that is what's required i think one entomologist said we need more of an inaction plan rather than an action plan um and i think if we just do that um 
if we just let things slide a bit, we, you know, it doesn't have to be an impossible problem. We can kind of, we can get this done. That's great. I love the, uh, we need an, an, an action plan. I think maybe we need both, right? We need an action plan and an yeah. action plan, but, um, but yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a great, <laughs> yeah. great quote. Yeah. We do have another question from uh, from the attendees. So um, someone asks, haven't there been countervailing studies and, and weren't there some questions about the German study? And then uh, follows up from that to say, if the statistics of insect decline are as severe as you seem to indicate, wouldn't we see much more precipitous consequences in the food supply? Yeah, there, there certainly are countervailing um ideas on this and I do kind of document that in my book and that there are scientists who say it's a bit too early to declare this, this kind of universal crisis because we don't know exactly what's happening in every part of the world. I mean we don't even know all the insects out there do we? I mean there's kind of estimates there may be five million species, 10 million, maybe 30 million. I mean we don't even know what's out there. It's kind of hard to say that they're all you know, in trouble. Uh, a lot of the studies are based in um, Europe and North America. We, we know far less about what's happening in the tropics uh, where most insect life obviously lives. Um, so we've only had glimpses so far of, of this, um, but there is enough evidence. Uh, a lot of scientists um, say that um, there's cause for alarm uh, and suggest that a much wider problem than we we are aware of now. It makes me think of climate change as well. There's lots of parallels here with climate change about how kind of 40 years ago, we did not have, you know, the full complete picture of the disaster of climate change. Um, and we kind of waited around to, in terms of doing something about that rather than acting on it. Um, and we're now left in this situation where we have just a tiny window of time left to kind of cut emissions to zero before truly disastrous things. Um, start to start to happen to us. Um, I feel we're at, at that at that point slightly earlier on with the insect crisis that you know we could wait for studies to be done in every single part of the world. Um, we could wait for a whole inventory of uh, declines in the tropics and uh, everywhere else. Um, by that point, things might have spiraled well out of control. I mean, if Flying insects have declined by three quarters in Germany um, in just you know thirty years or so. How much longer do we want to wait? I mean, I think that's that's the kind of key question. Like, do you want to wait another twenty years to get the full, complete picture from everywhere else to do something about it, or would it make sense to kind of enact some of these kind of policies, do something about it, given that those policies would help us in many other ways? I mean, would provide us a less, less toxic environment. We do something about climate change. Obviously that would uh, help us in many, many other ways as well. Um, habitat loss is a problem for many other species on the insects. So I feel we don't have to wait for uh, um, the complete story to be told on this because it, it may well be too late by that point. I think that's a great point. And um, there was that second part of the question that I think um, I might be at a good place to answer, which is this point about if these um, declines are as severe as some of these studies seem to indicate, wouldn't we be seeing much more uh, precipitous consequences in the food supply? And I think a, a lot of the, many of the food supply concerns anyway, come from, um, from pollinators and in most of the crops that are pollinator dependent, uh, farmers are bringing in honeybees. Um, so that, you know, we are bringing in these managed bees. We aren't relying on wild uh, bees and, and other uh, flies and butterflies and wasps and, and other um, wild pollinators, but instead really um, typically trucking in honeybees from, from other places. And I think that, um, even that sort of act in the United States of shipping these bees around the country has actually led to a lot of the concerns about um, declines in, in honeybees because we're spreading diseases among the um, among the honeybees that are there. Uh, we're uh, really ex forcing them to experience some quite stressful conditions with the um, with the shipping around, often kind of feeding them essentially junk food, so feeding them corn syrup. 
so that they can make it through these um, these journeys. And, and we know that that can weaken a lot of their immune responses. So, um, so there are concerns about these um, honeybees uh, and, and certainly as it relates to, um, to food production, but so far we've managed to maintain enough honeybees that we don't really have um, had these issues, but there is a lot of interest in, in developing alternative pollinators and, and even um, a lot of studies have shown that when farms are near uh, by to native habitat, that that, um, that that native habitat can actually really generate quite a lot of pollination services in the form of, of wild insects that can support um, that pollination and that, and that food production. And of course, there's an inherent risk, isn't there, of just being so dependent on honeybees. Um, you know, one disease could rip through the honeybee population and then you're in a massive strife, aren't you? I mean, I know they're affected by varroa mites and some other things, Nosema, but um, uh, being dependent on one species for your food production is a really risky <laughs> Yeah, it's, to be in, isn't it? it's a very risky business yes mm -hmm. absolutely and, and there's <clears throat> some really growing evidence from around the world that um there is this uh, a virus called deformed wing virus that is um spread around in part by um by varroa mites but really mm -hmm. is probably really causing a lot of um the problems that we're, that we're seeing but um those are often uh also exacerbated by the pesticide exposure um, exposure to some other chemicals like fungicides, even some of the quote inert ingredients and some of the agrochemicals uh, can be quite harmful um, to bees as well. And that's some, some very recent um, studies have been showing this about the, uh, the inert ingredients. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm gonna ask another question, Barry, from, from yeah, you. Yeah, please. And um, because, you know, I'm looking at the clock and I, like I said, we can, you know, talk, you know, with Oliver and you forever. But as a journalist, as a writer, what advice do you have for scientists working in this realm? Any advice for students who might be interested to work in this area? Oh, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I feel, um, I feel like the world of entomology has been kind of pushed to the forefront in recent years from the kind of a slightly kind of uh, dark corner of the scientific world in terms of the public perception anyway. Um, suddenly now you're getting entomologists all over the media and, and writing books and doing interviews and all that kind of thing where you didn't really have that um, maybe five, ten years ago uh, as much. So I would say, you know, part of the part of the job is how obviously learning how to convey your research to the public um, using stories that they people can feel connected to um, so you know I go through a lot of figures in my book and it can be quite distancing because it's just numbers but people really I think people really engage with the parts of my book I think where I'm talking about stories and people's kind of direct uh, experiences with insects and, um, things that they can relate to. So I, th I, I would suggest that entomologists use that. I mean, insects are the closest animal to us, um, animals to us, I think, other than our pets, really, if you think about it. I mean, in our day-to-day -day lives, we come in contact with insects more than any other creature other than dogs and cats, probably. Um, you know, a lot of those interactions are annoying to us <laughs> if it's a um, kind of mosquito bite or something. But you know, these are these are creatures we're familiar with. We kind of feel we know them. We um, we live alongside them very closely, and so I think kind of telling stories that um, relate to that familiar nature that we have with them, um, I think, is um, important to engage people with them and the importance of of conserving. Them. That's great. Um, I wanted to circle back to um, a, a question that Gabby had asked um, near the beginning about the sort of the genesis of the book and the idea. Um, but, but my question is, um, who is your favorite person to interview when, um, when writing the book? Um, and I think in the, I'd say in the, perhaps in the biological uh, science community, 
Um, entomologists sometimes have a reputation for being a little eccentric or, or quirky. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure you I'm sure you encountered some real characters uh, in, the, in the process of, of writing the book. But yeah, do you have a, a favorite story about that or a favorite person that you uh, interviewed when you were putting the book together? Oh, goodness. Yeah, there were so many great <laughs> characters. I mean, I went to Entomology 2019, which is the big kind of World Cup of Entomologists. It was held in St. Louis, um, uh, Missouri, just before um yeah. let's see the pandemic hit so i kind of got lucky there really um yeah. but yeah there were so many people with beards and wearing sandals with kind of funny <laughs> t-shirts um it was it was incredible really but obviously a really friendly friendly kind of crowd and um uh, uh very kind of knowledgeable and open um i mean i met spoke to many kind of interesting people there's um there's some somebody called um, erica McAllister who's the Head of entomology for the Naturalist Museum in London, and she's become a kind of minor celebrity in the UK. She's kind of on the BBC all the time. She's very kind of witty, and some of her quotes in the book were really kind of kind of standout quotes because she can really really kind of bring the subject alive. Um, um, there was a scientist in um, Mexico as well, uh, Potomac, um Sensa Romero, and he. Um, he was this really interesting guy. He liked to wear berets all the time. He had these kind of uh, waistcoats with lots of pockets on and quite an eccentric kind of guy. He liked to kind of go around in the mountains in Mexico on a horse. And so I had to go on a horse with him, and go up into the mountains and see the, the groves of trees where the monarch butterflies come in uh, into um, each year from the migration down from US and Canada. And I mean, that was just a pure, you know, that was a magical moment. Um, mm. And it was good to spend that time with him there. <laughs> uh, I could have had worse company. So yeah, there's lots of really kind of interesting, interesting people doing some really kind of important kind of undervalued work out there. So are you already working on the next book? <laughs> Oh, no, I'm not yet. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about what that may be, but then also mm -hmm. thought about the process of writing this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, probably wouldn't be as hard as this because hopefully I wouldn't be confined to a, a small apartment in New York City with two young children and a pandemic raging outside. But um, yeah, it's, it's a long process. It's kind of different from journalism. I kind of thought there'd be a lot of similarities to journalism, but... Um, you know the, the publishing world is is very different um and uh, uh requires a lot of patience um i mean i finished writing this book maybe nearly a year ago now so <clears throat> you know i've been thinking about this topic for a, for a while now um, mm -hmm. usually in journalism you just write and move on um so i have to think about what i really want to think about deeply next i think for the next book Maybe a children's book, a version of this book, but for children. Yeah. Yeah, that would work well. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd have some good illustrator for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question actually in the um, in the chat about um, how would we cancel homeowners who find a bee's nest in their backyard. Um, some homeowners have been taught uh, to call an exterminator or to buy um, bee and wasp killer sprays at the, uh, at the drugstore. So do you have any ideas or guidance for homeowners in this situation? So um, I, I can maybe jump in on, on that one um, to say um, if, if you do find a honeybee uh, nest, um, there are very often beekeepers who would who would love to um, take that um, off of your hands and, and out of your property. Um, so I would uh, I would suggest to people to call local um, beekeeper associations and um, I think even you know doing a web search for um, you know uh, honeybee. Um, removal and just kind of making sure that um, the, whoever is coming to do the removal isn't going to um, isn't going to kill that um, colony. I think is a is a really good way to go. Um, if you if you find a, a bee's nest that's not a um, honeybee uh, colony, um, really the the only other real option here in um, in Washington is that you have a bumblebee nest, which is probably um, in the ground or, or maybe in a, 
they will occasionally take up residence in birdhouses and some things like that. And I would just really encourage you if you have a bumblebee nest in your yard to um, to leave it alone, <laughs> to mm -hmm. you know maybe put a little um, fence or structure around it so that no one walks on it. But um, they they tend to be extremely um, you know uh, harmless, I guess, unless you really get in there and, and really annoy them. Um, I was doing field work once um, uh, in, in Colorado and um, my team had sort of set up in this one spot and with a bunch of students and everything and people had kind of thrown their backpacks down on the ground and, and um, we were eating lunch and I noticed that there were a bunch of bumblebees circling around one student's backpack. And I was like, hmm, no wonder what's going on there. So I, I pulled it away and I watched them land and all kind of crawl in um, to this very hidden um, uh, hole. But we were all there like really close to their nest, eating, talking really loudly, um, all this stuff, six or seven people, you know, and, and literally physically blocking the entrance to their nest. And they, they were very, um, very chill about it. Um, so the bumblebee nests tend to be um, pretty small, um, usually up to a few dozen um, bees and the other thing about them is that they're annual so that the end of the year and in the, in the fall and the end of the growing season I should say um, that nest will um, the queen from that nest will die they'll produce new queens that will um, fly away and, and hibernate somewhere else so those are um, not really um, things to, to worry too much about but definitely to try and, and uh, protect mm -hmm. yeah I mean, I think you'd be really lucky if you have a bumblebee nest in your exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. You feel blessed. I mean, yeah. I think there was one entomologist I spoke to who said that 20 years ago she would get calls from people who were um, terrified that they had, when they found bees in their yard and wanted to find out how to kill them. But now that's changed and people feel, um, they ask her more, like, how do I keep them alive? How do I help them? So I think there has been a positive change, change in that yeah. um, anecdotally. I don't know, yeah. no research on that, but um, I think people hopefully don't automatically want to kill all the bees. In, yes, <laughs> in agreed. Their garden. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Professor, for that answer. That was actually my question. I don't have your, your uh, <laughs> knowledge and your your expertise. I'm, I'm I was an English major, but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, as a homeowner, I I'm, I just want to know what we can do. On, on our level, you know, more to, to protect the insects. Um, Cause I know I grew up in the seventies and back then, you know, there were movies like the swarm and there were <laughs> yeah. killer bees coming up, and, you know, and, and now we have murder hornets and everybody tells a story about somebody who, you know, got a bee sting and, and, and stopped breathing or something like that. So, I mean, there's, like you were saying, you know, insects, we've been trained, you know, to be afraid of them through media and, and, and um, Oliver, you said even through teachers and through parents. And actually, I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm pleased and a little embarrassed to say the one that kind of turned me around was my daughter. And so it wasn't a parent educating a child; it was my child educating me about you know bees and the importance of bees. And that was several years ago. I did want to touch on just a few things, other things in your book. I got to tell you, uh, I I bought your book to get ready for this program, and. I found it absolutely mesmerizing and some of the positive things about bugs that I, I had no awareness is, you know, you said in your book, uh, a COVID vaccine was actually made from re-engineered moth cells, which was really interesting. And in, in that uh, there are some extracts from cockroach bodies that can kill some cancer cells. And yeah. you demonstrate how important uh, bugs are to the food chain by, there was, uh, a statistic that showed that a baby bird needs to eat about 200,000 insects to grow into adulthood, which really shows how important they are to the food chain. And um, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, and there's one, another quote in the book that said, all insects, and I repeat, all insects play a role in pollination, decomposition, or the food chain. Really, really a fascinating book, mesmerizing. And so I want to take this opportunity to, you know, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, the book again is The Insect Crisis, and you can order it through our website, ebookstore.com.
Oliver and Professor Bro Brosi and Dr. Chabarier, I thank you all so much. It has been a distinct pleasure to, to talk with you tonight. And I wanna thank everybody in our audience today. Uh, any last words from any of you tonight? Just no, I'd just say thank you for, for having me and it's been really great to, to chat to you um, chat to you all about this. It's been a really fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed the uh, back and forth. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah this was fantastic. Yeah. yeah, this was fantastic. Thank you. Yes. All right. Well, thank you all. And thank you all for watching. Have a good night and we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye.